Okay, so tonight is the um, fourth talk of this series on the geography and the political history uh, surrounding the early years of Buddhism. In the first talk we were looking at the first year after the Buddha's enlightenment and just looking where he was active. And then the second talk we were looking at the last year of the Buddha's life to see just where, where he went. Actually quite a big journey really especially if you're having to walk everywhere. So in those days, and even in the missionary times, then the, the monks who went out, and we'll see how far they went later, they wouldn't travel, you know, by vehicle, because in the Vinaya, then traveling by a vehicle is not allowed. But in those days, they even traveled, what is basically thousands of miles, you know, but they would do it on foot. So I think it was a different, different, uh, different way of life in those days. And maybe they had more time, I don't know. Anyway, as we saw during that first period, basically this is really the area where the Buddha and his immediate disciples was active. This is where he was born. This is where he attained awakening. This is where he did his first teaching. This is where he passed away. Around here is where he did most of the teaching. It's at Salvati. Then as we saw, in the centuries that followed, there was three councils that were held. The councils were held for a couple of reasons. One was to collect the teachings. And then the second one is really to confirm which were the genuine teachings and which, which teachings should be rejected. I think in the first council, if we think about it, what they must have done is set up ways of collecting that material. And so they talk about baskets. The T pitika means the three baskets, as you might have heard. So those baskets were really kind of like containers. We can't imagine them as being actual baskets. It's like a, a metaphorical use of the term. But they set up various categories and ways of collecting the material at the First Council. The way it's told in the uh, commentaries now is that the way that we have the Theravada scriptures as they are now is exactly as they recited it at the First Council. But it's really impossible to believe that it's that situation because we can't account for the other collections of the scriptures that way. But what we could understand is that they organize categories. Like in the uh, discourses, we have these sorts of categories, like the long discourses, the Diga Nikaya. So they were to go into one category and be collected there. You know, there's 34 now in our version of the Tipitika. They might have had even, you know, 20 or something. I'm, I don't know, of course. Uh, they might have had quite a few, but they almost certainly wouldn't have had all 34 at the first council, you know. They would have been collected under that category over the coming years. And then you've got the Majjhima Nikaya, that's the middle length discourses. The Sanyata Nikaya, that's the thematic discourses. The discourses that are related by a theme of some sort or other. Sometimes it's a doctrinal theme, like the Nidhanawaga. The Nidhanawaga collects all the, all the suttas, all the teachings that they could be remembered about Paticca Samuppada, dependent origination. Other ones work collected other themes were around personalities. So we have like Kosala Wagga. Kosala Wagga was the discourses that were told around King, King Kosala. Other things were like uh, Bhikkhuni Wagga, the, the discourses that were remembered from the Bhikkhunis, and so on like this. So there's different ways, different ways of assembling these themes, 
but eventually they had 56 themes in the Sam Samyutta Nikaya. And then the Anguttara Nikaya, which uh, collected things according to the, the item numbers, things that are of, are of ones, things that are of twos, things that are of threes, all the way up to elevens. So, like this, I think they probably at that first council set up a way of collecting material, and then over the next couple of hundred years, you know, as they came across teachers who had remembered discourses and things, they would be added in to those categories as they would fit. If we took it like that, we could explain very easily the discrepancies between like the Theravada Nikayas and the Chinese Agamas, because if we've got categories and the categories are generally the same, but the contents are different, but this, this argument would actually explain how that came about. And then at the third council, by that time, Buddhism, as we saw last week, the, you know, the, the, the whole empire now is about this size. That means the Ashokan Empire. It's quite a big area and everything. And Buddhism had spread through the empire and had become the most successful uh, teaching in the empire at that time. And a lot of the other ascetic groups who had lost out on supporters and things like this, those ascetics, some of those ascetics kind of um, surreptitiously, if you like, entered the Buddhist Sangha, but they would still teach their old teachings. But they would actually be in robes, look like monks, claim that they're teaching what the Buddha taught, but not teaching something else. So that had become a big issue in Ashoka's time because of the success of the sasana. It actually attracted people from other groups who were not doing so well. So one of the things that they did before the third council was to purify the sangha. It tells a nice story actually how they did it. Then uh, King Ashoka and Mowgli Bhutatissa, who was the leading monk, he was the uh, leading monk at the Third Council when it happened as well, one of the very senior monks. And they set up a kind of curtain in front of them. And then they invited uh, monks to come in and they asked them, what do you teach? Like this. And then they would tell their, all their wrong views and so on like this. But they don't know who they're telling it to, you see. So Mowgli Puta is able to... Uh, advise King Ashoka, you know, this is not what the Buddha taught. <laughs> and then the next person would come and he, he would ask him, what, you know, what is the teaching of the Buddha? And then uh, he, he would say something that was correct. And then Mowgli Buddha Dissa would tell, you know, that's correct teaching. So they said they, they, they did it like this. They set up a screen and then invited monks in and asked them what's the teaching of the Buddha. And then they kind of managed to separate those who were actually teaching what the Buddha had taught uh, at the beginning from those who had kind of come into the Sangha just for the profit of it. And then they disrobed those monks out of the Sangha. This happened not just once actually, this has happened a number of times throughout Buddhist history that the kings have taken it as their duty to purify the Sangha when it's come down into a state of corruption. It also happened during Parakramabahu's time in the high middle ages, that means around the uh, 13th century. And again at that time the Sangha was in a state of corruption and then the king purified the Sangha and then uh, disrobed the monks. Some of the monks had wives and so on and so forth like this. So they're kind of identifiable. So in, in that way they also did a purification. So it's not just happened once, it's actually happened a handful of times. After the purification of the, of the Sangha, then they held the third council. Now at the first council, as I think most people know, there were 500 Arahats present. At the second council, there were 700 Arahats present. At the third council, you see, by that time, 
it's all over the empire. It's a well-established religion by that time. Many monks in the religion and available, and many have done very well. So at the Third Council, there were a thousand monks. And I think at the Third Council, what you can say has happened is, whereas at the First Council, Second Council, and during that period, they were collecting the scriptures, at the Third Council, they basically confirmed what are the scriptures. And I think now, what we receive in the Theravada canon, the canon was more or less closed by the Third Council. I think actually there's one or two scriptures that come in later, like the Patisambhida Magga is probably a little later than the Third Council. The uh, Parivara in the Vinaya is later as well. We know that because it was written in Sri Lanka. It's like a tabulation of the rules and how they can be applied in things. It's not in the, it's no, there's no innovation, I don't think, anyway. There's no innovation in the Parivara. It's really a tabulation of what, is, uh, what the teachings were in the Vinaya so that the people could learn them in an orderly manner, if you like. So that's the Third Council. After the Third Council, as we saw last month when we did the talk on the missions, then Ashoka sent out the missionaries to the border areas it's known as the Dhamma Vijaya. It means the, the victory of the Dhamma. Instead of going to the border areas and fighting the barbarians and bringing them within the empire, which is what is normally done with empires, you know, you, you go and you try to con conquer further areas by force, and then you expand your borders and everything like that. Instead of, instead of that, then Ashoka sent out these missionaries and tried to conquer people by Dhamma. That means convert them, if you like, to civilized behavior. A lot of the people in the border areas were not very civilized, which tends to be the case throughout history, really. He sent out these missionaries. Now, as I was saying earlier, they wouldn't travel, they wouldn't travel by vehicle because vehicles are not allowed in the Vinaya. So, for instance, when, when Mahinda went down, it says that he flew through the air f with his, you know, his psychic powers. Because he had the psychic powers, he, could, he and his companions, they were actually in Avanti, which is around he here, this area. And um, from, they were on a mountain, as it happens, which is where uh, the, the monastery they were staying. And then they rose up into the air and they flew down to Sri Lanka. It actually plays a part in the conversion of King Devanampiyatissa, who was the king in Sri Lanka at that time. Because um, he asked, how did you get here? And Mahinda didn't say directly. He said, we came neither by land nor by sea. And then the king thought about it and he thought, oh, they've come through the air. <laughs> And it was part of this thing, I think I was saying last time, you know. There, there were two aspects in these missions. One was to impress the people with the powers that the religion had. So these psychic powers also played a part in this, you know. The demonstration that they, were, they had these powers was an important part of the missions. And afterwards, when they've made a sufficient impression on people, like the kings or the populace or whatever it was, at that point they taught Dhamma. And when they taught Dhamma, you know, that also made a, a, another impression, if you like, a different sort of impression, and then people converted. But this kind of show of psychic powers and things like that was, was some sort of um, foundational thing for some of the missions, you know, so that the people understood that, th that these people are worth listening to. Look, they have these powers. If they've got these powers, they must be worth listening to. Then they give ear and they teach the Dhamma. So there was some sort of um, thing like that going on. How all the other monks went out, I'm not quite sure, went out to the various areas, you know, whether they flew through the air or whether they just walked 
people were in fact walking long ways. Like we have a story in the tree Pitika about Bhavari, and Bhavari was from this sort of area, like Aparantika. And he walked, I worked it out because they listed all the towns that he went through. He heard that a Buddha had arisen in the world. Because it's such a rare event, he decided to send his disciples to go and see the Buddha. Right? So there's a, there's a list of the towns that they went through, and they went through this kind of um, pathway like this. And eventually they met up in Rajagaha, which is just south of Pataliputta. I measured it on a map, just how far they'd gone. And they walked uh, 1,800 kilometers to go and see the Buddha. I think it's really, really fantastic, you know. You can walk actually about um, 20 kilometers a day. So it would be months and months of walking through India, you know, because you've heard that the Buddha has arisen. So I think, uh, myself, I find that really inspiring somehow, you know, that people would have such a dedication and everything and would be prepared to go so far to try to confirm that there's a Buddha in the world. And of course, when they got there, you know, they talked with the Buddha, and there they, they were 16 Brahmin meditation masters, you can say, and they asked very pointed questions to the Buddha, and then the Buddha gave answers, and, you know, it's told one by one. So the first one is Ajita. Ajita asks a question, and then the Buddha answers it, and then he asks another question, and the Buddha answers it, and then Ajita becomes an Arahat. And then the second one, Tissamateya asks the questions, and then the Buddha gives answers. And again, because they were actually meditation masters, got very deep and purified minds, then when they got the insight that the Buddha was able to give, then they attained Arahatship. So it happened with all 16 of them. So it's worth the trip, you see. Anyway, what, what, I'm, what I'm saying that for is that people would actually, it would in actual fact walk long, long distances, which we would never consider doing. You know, but in those days they did because basically that's the only way to go. Even when, you know, when they went in caravans, they, they didn't travel in the caravan, they walked with the caravan. The caravan is pulling the goods, you know, you've got oxen and then you've got a wagon and the wagon is filled up with goods, including your food and water and everything that you might need and you all walk together. So even when you went by a caravan, it, it doesn't mean that you sat in the back of a caravan, you know, maybe the owner of the caravan did, you know, most people would have walked with it, you see. So that was the way that they got from one place to another and sometimes through very dangerous areas and so on. Now, one thing I want to uh, point out is, you see, th that happened with these missions, because this becomes very important, is, you know, when the missions went down to Sri Lanka, for instance, M Mahinda went down to Sri Lanka, he never returned. And he sent for his sister, Sangamitta, that's the, you know, it's the son and daughter of King Ashoka. And they both were ordained. He sent for Sangamitta, and there's a very moving scene actually in um, the Mahawamsa when they talk about this. And King Ashoka said, because his grandson was also, Sumana had also gone with Mahinda. And uh, King Ashoka says to Sangamitta, his daughter, he says, I've already lost my son, and I've already lost my grandson. And now you also want to go, you know, I'm going to be left with nobody. It's actually, the way it's told, it's quite, quite moving, I think, you know. Because when they went out, had the kind of, maybe the intuition, you know, he's never going to see them again. And that was actually the case. Mahinda and Sangamitta spent decades in uh, Sri Lanka establishing the sasana there, and they never returned. And King Ashoka anyway died after a few years, not long after they'd gone. But even if he hadn't have died, they never came back. Another group went out to Kashmir Gandhara. From here to here is thousands of kilometers. I think about 3,000 kilometers. 
So one of the things I'd like to impress on you is, up until that time, basically, Buddhism was a unitary organization in the Middle Lands and around the Middle Lands. Because of these missions, they were sent way out from each other, you know. And then the religion started to develop in isolation from each other. Right, when Mahinda went down here, then there's a whole Acharya Parampara, that means a lineage of teachers. But those lineage of teachers now, and the teachings they're giving, are just in Sri Lanka and those areas. In fact, also in Tamil Nadu and those sort of areas. These were very closely related. You see, but the teachings that were being given in the remote areas up like in Kashmir were not so much in contact with the teachings down here. So they developed in different ways. This is important because it's one of the reasons why you're getting different schools of Buddhism because of simple physical, geographical isolation of the monastics from each other. And then teachings over a period of time are arising in those traditions which are different from the teachings that are arising 3,000 kilometers away. It's bound to happen, you see. By the time you get to the fourth council, what we call the fourth council in the Theravada is completely unknown to the northern school. And what they call the, the fourth council in the northern school is completely unknown to the southern school, the Theravada school because of this geographical separation, you see. So the fourth council, which is known in the Theravada tradition, is when they wrote down the scriptures in Sri Lanka. That was in the first century BC. What had happened is there'd been invasions from Tamil Nadu, and there had been wars and so on, and it had very, very greatly disrupted the religion as well as the country. You know, it's disrupting the country and because it's disrupting the country, it's also disrupting the religion. That means this monasteries were sacked, monks were killed, there were famines that uh, followed these wars. And what, the reason that they wrote down the scriptures it's not because they had the bright idea of writing down the scriptures eventually, but because they were in danger of being lost. It was like an existential problem that had arisen. Normally, religious scriptures in India were not written, were not written down. It was not traditional to write down the scriptures. Even for that matter, the Theravada scriptures were also, you know, the, the pupil was supposed to learn them. The, the way to pass down the scriptures is not through the written form, but by oral transmission. And that was very important. So even after the scriptures were written down in um, Sri Lanka, two things about it. One thing is, the way that they're written down, we can see that they're what we call an aid de memoir. That's an aid to the memory. They're not written out in full. We have many what are called payala passages where it only says pay. And it means that the reciter taking the pattern from the earlier part of the scripture should fill it in for this part of the scripture. But they don't write it down. It's simply an aid to memoir. The person would use it if he, used, if he needed to use it at all just to remind himself of where he is in the passage. But in fact he would have it by memory. Those scriptures also, by the way, in Sri Lanka, they're written on ola leaves. That means palm leaves. Those palm leaves, at the, at the very most, only last two or three centuries. So before two or three centuries are out, you've got to have somebody copy it. And then they decay, and it's copied, and it's copied, and it's copied, and it's copied. The, old, the oldest scriptures we've got on palm leaves only go back to about the 16th century, the very oldest that we have. There are copies of copies of copies of copies of copies of copies. In the northern tradition, 
Uh, some of the scriptures that we that have been found from Gandhara, which is this this area here, actually, basically, uh, they were written down not on ola leaves but on birch bark, and the climate is completely different down here. It's a very humid climate, and materials don't last long in humidity. Up here, it's a very dry climate. And things last for a very long time. So we have scriptures actually from the first century BC. The oldest physical book that we have in the world is a copy of the what's called the Gandhara Dhammapada. It doesn't. It's not. It's not the same as our Dhammapada, but it's similar. But it's not the same, and it's not in the same language either. But that's the oldest book in the world. It was found. Um, this is also a bit interesting, I think. It was found in the 19th century. You know, in the 19th century, the European explorers were going into Central Asia looking for archaeological remains and looking for treasures. And uh, there's a re really ter terrible thing, <laughs> in a way, anyway, that happened. The locals know how valuable anything is it, 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 you know these old texts and things the Europeans were buying them for what for the locals is a lot of money now in actual fact it's like a pittance you know if if you try to buy those scriptures now you're talking about millions and millions of dollars they trade on the international you know on the international antiquities market at millions and millions of dollars but in those days they were paying like tens of dollars or like scores of dollars, that sort of thing, you know. But th those scores of dollars to the local people, just, you know, they're just taking things and, you know, selling it to the European archaeologists. You know, to them it's a lot of money, so they were doing it. So one of them got hold of this Gandhara Dhammapada. He doesn't know what it is, you know, and he doesn't care what it is either. So what, what he did, but what he knows is he can sell it. So what he did was... He took it and he ripped it into three pieces. He ripped it, not even vertically, if you like, but, but across the scriptures. So he sold one to the French, he sold one to the Russian, and the third part of that scripture completely disappeared. It's never been found. It's, it was lost altogether. So what we have now for the Gandhara Dhammapada is just two-thirds of it, and a lot of it is just flakes just broken as he ripped it but it, sh it shows you even now they're still finding um, things in these deserts and everything so the fourth uh, council in the Theravada was counted when they wrote down the scriptures I don't know whether you can say it's by coincidence or what it is but at the fourth council that is counted in the Mayana tradition that was the Sarvastivada council that took place took place in Kashmir under the Kushan kings who were big supporters of the uh, Buddhist religion a bit like Kanishka was a bit like a second Ashoka and uh, a very very strong supporter so he called a fourth council uh, that, that council one of the main things they did was not write not just write down the scriptures that they had received in the Sarvastivada uh, tradition, but also write down some of the commentaries. So one of the main commentaries in the uh, Mayana tradition is the Mahavibhasa. The Mahavibhasa actually is an enormous commentary, and that's one of the main outcomes of that fourth council, which was held in the first century AD. So it's like a couple of hundred years later. We don't, of course, know the the exact date. I think with the council for the Theravadan, it's something like 70 BC and because the Theravadans were great chronicle writers um, then we know more or less the date it, with this one it's something like 83 AD but we don't exactly know so there's probably 150 years between them but, the, but you see what has happened is that the schools have got separated yeah? you've now got a southern tradition which we now call the Theravada, and you've got a northern tradition, uh, which eventually developed into the what we call the Mayana. But the Mayana itself, you see, 
is not it's not a unitary phenomena that means there's there's not one teaching that arose at one point there appears to have been different teachings very different from each other that arose in different schools that eventually gave rise to what we now call the mahayana so for instance the lotus sutra very famous sutra we we think arose probably in this gandhara kashmira gandhara area it's not certain but it's it that's the, that's what that's what is believed nagarjuna who is counted now as the second buddha in the mahayana tradition nagarjuna was teaching in what is basically andhra pradesh and now you can go to andhra pradesh and you can go to nagarjuna konda that's an area where there were a lot of the temples temples from sri lanka uh, temp you know indigenous uh, temples also temples from other areas you can find them all in this place but that's where nagarjuna was teaching and he taught the what is called the majjhimaka teachings or the prajnaparamita teachings if you know does, do people know about about these things the prajnaparamita it means the perfection of wisdom teachings the heart sutra because it's it's like an essence of the prajnaparamita teachings uh, so it's been brought down and that is the one that is popular why because it's so small and it's digestible and people can recite it and it acts like a mantra and all these sort of things this is like the essence of the prajnaparamita teachings but the prajnaparamita teachings themselves there's some that go to 20000 verses it's very very long some of those prajnaparamita teachings go to uh, 50000 verses it's extremely long and others go to 100000 verses so those are extremely elaborate and complex philosophical teachings that have been given they 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 they're all traced back to nagarjuna but nobody's going to sit there chanting 100000 verses because it would take you months to be able to chant them you see so they're not popular so that was once one school of thought that that arose that was part of the mayana it arose actually in andhra and andhra was a theravada stronghold then later you know around the 5th century these universities these great medieval universities started that means like nalanda and uh, vikramasila nalanda and vikramasila were the two really big uh universities in the middle ages they sometimes had as many as 10000 monks uh studying at those universities i mean that's really quite enormous you know Th this is like the you know the very you know the very beginning of the middle ages you know and they got 10000 people studying and there's not just one of these universities there's you know there's a number of them but they gave rise to the yogachara teachings so those are that's a different school of the mayana when sun chan came to, from china it was for the yogachara teachings that was what he took back to china eventually you see the big breakthrough was when uh, the chinese invented paper and when they invented paper what what they did is they made uh, wood blocks they carved out wood blocks of the scriptures and from those wood blocks you can make an impression it's a printing it's actually the earliest printing and the earliest books that were ever printed are buddhist books in the history of the world nearly all the greatest inventions from the very beginning are all related to buddhism it's not understood now but so many of these things cultural inventions uh, are, are absolutely intimately related to the uh, spread of buddhism so th this also is the same thing the, what what they want what they wanted to uh, do was you know once you've got a wood block that is correct you can print and print and print and print and print and you can send to monasteries anywhere you like yeah
you can make, uh, you can, even now you see, uh, woodblock printing reached Korea probably around the 8th or the 9th century, and you can still see those woodblocks and they can still make those scriptures, they can still print those scriptures from those woodblocks today. They actually fill whole libraries, you know. The amount of work that's gone into making those woodblocks is really incredible, you know. Really a dedication of effort. Uh, but once you've got the woodblock, you can reproduce it. That's why sometimes I say to you, you know, you, you, should, you should bear in mind the, the amount of effort that the Sangha put into passing down the uh, teachings of Lord Buddha through the ages. Nowadays, we take it for granted. We got hundreds of books, thousands of books. They're just kind of, you know, just left there. They're not respected. In ancient times, books were looked, books themselves were looked on as sacred. Now, we're talking about the spread of Buddhism after the period of Ashoka. So, it had spread into these widely separated areas and then it was spread further, further on. So we saw that it had already gone to Suvanabhumi, which is this area here, as part of the missions, you see. It had already gone out to Suvanabhumi, already gone out to Sri Lanka and Kashmir. Just remember Kashmir Gandhara for later. From there, it also came down into Malaysia and into Sumatra and then down into Java, Bali, up into the Khmer lands. These areas here are the Pu lands, the Mon lands and the Khmer lands. The Khmers actually, that means that what we now call Cambodians, Cambodians, from archaeological evidence and um, uh, what we can understand, have been in this area for thousands of years, where the uh, Thais were at, at this point, that means, say, uh, in the early centuries of the Christian era, the Thais were was, was somewhere in China, up around Mongolia, and they've migrated down through Yunnan, and eventually into what we now call Thailand. Their language is uh, related to Mongolian, so we can understand where their migrations have taken place. And the Burmese, their language is related to Tibetan. And they've come off the Tibetan plateau and down into Burma. Yeah. At this point, they were not there. The Pews were there, the Mons were there, the Mons in, the, in this early Middle Ages period were one of the major peoples in Southeast Asia, and the Khmer were also. Now both the Mon have been pushed back, you know, by the influx of the Thais and the Burmese, and now they just exist in a little area, I think around here, and they're not so populous as a people. And the Cambodians also were pushed back into what we now call this, you know, smaller country of uh, Cambodia. But they were they they were a major uh, political force in the Middle Ages. Okay, so also it was brought down into Malaya. These are on the silk routes. So I I just show you the silk routes because. Buddhism traveled, you know, to its destinations along the trading routes that had been established. These routes actually were quite dangerous. Whether you go by sea or whether you go by land, I'll come to the land routes later, okay. By sea, what was the problem? What is the problem now in the Malacca Straits, even to this day? Pirates. But in those days, it was you know, very lawless, you know. You, you want to get through to the China, which is where the silk is. You know, you're trying to get up to here and up to here and get into China. Because silk, if you've got silk from China, 
and you took it back to India or you took it over to Rome, you can sell it for an absolute fortune, you know. Really a fortune. Not only silk, there were, there were so many things that were uh, available in China that the, that the Indians and the Romans wanted and there were so many things that were available like gold and silver and so on in Rome uh, that were needed in China. So this built up these silk roads. They would either come down by the maritime passages. These are the maritime passages. Right, you either go this way or you go this way. I'll explain about this in a minute. Or by the land passages. I'll come to the land passages afterwards because that's the, the, in fact the way that Buddhism reached to China. These pass these trading routes came down here, and because they didn't want to go down the Malacca Straits, which is where the pirates were operating, and then the people would, you know. They, they invest all their money and then the pirates attack and they take all their goods and they lost all their goods and maybe their lives. Instead of going down through the Malacca Straits, another route was to cross overland. You get your ship to the isthmus, you put it on sleds and you drag it across to the other side of the isthmus. So, you know where the Bujang Valley is, underneath Mount Jirai. That is the Bujang Valley civilization. Uh, it stretches all the way down to Bukit Mertjan. We can see remains of the Bujang Valley civilization uh, in St. Anne's Church. There's an inscription in St. Anne's Church from the very earliest period, from about, I think, from the 5th century AD. So that Bujang Valley civilization was very early and it's because of these trading routes. What they would do is get to Mount Jirai itself. Gunang Jirai is, is, is very visible from the sea. When you're coming down with the trade winds in a ship, you can see it. It's um, a marker, you know, on the horizon. So they would come down they know where Mount Jirai is. They land underneath it. There was a big shipping area there and trading area as well. They would either sell their goods at that point to people who would then drag it across the isthmus to the South China Sea, this area, and then take it on. Or they would take it over themselves, you know. But that, that's, what they, that's what would happen. Bujang Valley civilization, the archaeological remains, are the, the earliest uh, remains of the Indianized cultures in Southeast Asia. They're dated, carbon dated, back now to the first century AD. That's way earlier than any of these Indianized states in Southeast Asia. Malaysia has these remains, but they're not extensive, you see. Un unlike the Angkor remains, which date from the um, 9th to the uh, 13th century, it's much later. Unlike Borobudur, which dates from the 9th century and those related um, Chandis in Indonesia, the, the remains in Malaysia are not so grand. They're not so impressive, but they're much older, actually. They date back to the 1st century uh, AD, which is much older than these other remains, you see. The, the other ones that we know of, um, the remains from my son in Vietnam, this area, they're from 4th century. That's the next oldest archaeological remains in, of the Indianized cultures in Southeast Asia. It's about three centuries after the remains that are in Malaysia. So there were two routes. You could go over this way, or you could go down this way. So these kingdoms also became very, very prosperous because they're on the trade routes, you know? So in Sumatra, it gave rise to the Sri Vijaya Empire, eventually, which you probably all heard of, I hope, anyway. 
The Sri Vijaya Empire was a very important empire during the Middle Ages. It's a Malay empire. The Malays were Buddhist and Hindu. Uh, but the, the, the Sri Vijayan Empire was actually Buddhist. And they conquered Java. When they conquered Java, to embody their religion, they built a huge monument, which is Borobudur. But it's actually commissioned by Buddhist Malays, you see. And it's built by Indonesians. That's how Borobudur was built. But that's around the 9th century. I'm not going up that far, but I just want to show you the roots by which and why these religions spread out, you see. It was along these trading routes. Now, one important factor is this. From the very earliest times, as we've discussed in the earlier talks, the big supporters for the Buddhist religion were the merchants and the kings. The Brahmins, which was the priestly caste, were kind of uh, an opposition group, if you like. Uh, but the supporters for the Buddhist religion were always the merchants and the kings. And it's the merchants that are going out and it's the kings that are converting. So Buddhism was very successful because it's got the right clientele. The merchants can spread it. It becomes very important when we go on to look at the northern routes. Because Buddhism went over to China on the northern land routes, not this way originally, but this way. It's enormously difficult. It's hard to even tell you how difficult it is. Some of the passes through the Pamiya Mountains, the lowest pass is about, I think, 13 or 16,000 feet. I forget which it is. It's extremely high, very dangerous, probably always under snow. And when you get through the Pamiyas, you enter into the Taklamakan Desert. Taklamakan itself means the desert of death because it's, it's so dry. There's no... You get, and you know, the people are walking. When uh, Zonchan started out, I think he had a party of about 60, 50 or 60. By the time they got through, it was down to 15. The rest had actually died on the way. That means they'd either died from the heat or from the cold in the Taklamakan Desert. It shows up like just like a, a desert, actually. Because I've written all over it with these arrows, you can't quite see it. But it's very visible, even from a satellite image. You can see it's just like a barren expanse there. And then when you get, want to get over into India, and on, if you want to go into I Iran and over into Europe, uh, you've got to cross the Pamiyas. And the Pamiyas are extremely high. They're in now what is Afghanistan. So that also, you know, earlier we were talking about the dedication of Bavari students who walked when they heard that there was a Buddha. They walked, you know, across India to Rajagaha so that they could meet the Buddha. But, you know, now we're talking about, that's a little distance, if you see it on the map. Now we're talking about walking from the middle of China through deserts over, you know, mountain passes down through, through these areas and down to Pataliputta. They were actually going to Nalanda, you see. So going down to Nalanda in order to collect the scriptures. And then what he, what he did, he stayed in India for um, about 10 years or something, learning from the great teachers. There was, a, there was a teacher who was in charge, at least according to the memoirs of uh, Zwanshan, called uh, Silananda. He was the monk who was in charge of Nalanda at that time. And he was teaching the Yogacara teachings. So Zanshan collected those teachings. Now remember, they're still on like palm leaves and everything. So he had to, you know, some of those teachings were commissioned to be written. It took years to write them. You can't just pick up a book, you know, at the bookshop. You know, put it on the back of your donkey and off you go. These scriptures are very, very rare. They're extremely valuable because of their rarity and so on. They had to, in some cases, they had to be commissioned. On the other hand, they're extremely long. 
It's not just like you're collecting the Heart Sutra, you know. I think when uh, Zanshan went back to China, he took something like a train of something like 20 or 30 donkeys that were all carrying an enormous amount of scriptures that were strapped onto, uh, strapped onto those donkeys, you know. An enormous amount, you see. And it, it was a, a, an incredible treasure because those scriptures were not available in China. And what is more, somebody who could interpret them was not available in China. So he took those back and then uh, he, spent, he spent something like, was it 13 years for the whole journey, there and back, and then he spent the rest of his life translating it or overseeing the translation of those scriptures. An enormous amount of dedicated work on, the, on the behalf of this particular person, you know. But he, when he was back in China, he had a whole school, like, I, I mean, it would be a, like a whole hall full of people, scribes, who were writing it down, and he would, he would explain it, because it's in Sanskrit, he had learned Sanskrit, and it needs to be in Chinese. Yeah. So he would do an oral translation of the scriptures, and then the scribes write it down in Chinese. The earliest scriptures, actually, that went across, very similar to the Theravada scriptures, that means the Agamas. So the Agamas were the original te teachings Taken off, taken across in the first century. Zhuang San is in the uh, seventh century, I think. Uh, so much later, in the earliest times, the earliest teachings that reached China are very similar to the uh, Theravada teachings that reached Sri Lanka, and they, they, their translators were the people, you know, the peoples from Central Asia, Central Asians who were Buddhist like the Cotonese, the Sogdians, the earliest translators were, were monks from these areas because they were in the middle. They knew both Chinese, because of the trade routes, you see, they knew both Chinese, and the monks had learned Sanskrit, and uh, the Prakrits, the uh, early Prakrit languages, that means the uh, Indian languages, and they were able to translated into Chinese. So the earliest translations are actually, of course, of the Agamas, and still in the Mahayana scriptures you, you've got the Agamas, uh, which are very similar indeed to the, the Nikayan teachings that we have in the Theravada. That means like Diga Nikaya and Majjhima Nikaya and Samyutta Nikaya. They have equivalents in the uh, Agamas, it's the Diga Agama, the Majjhima Agama, and the uh, Sanyata Agama, and the Ekotara Agama. Those four collections, they're not identical, but they're very, very similar. And the teaching, if you look at it in a general way, not the particulars, but if you look at the general teaching, it's the same. And it's obviously coming from the earliest traditions. So those were the first teachings that went into China. And those teachings still exist. If you look in the Taisho catalog or whatever of the Mayana teachings, you find all the Agamas are there and everything, you know. And people like in recent years, like Yin Shun, not teaching the Mayana teachings, but teaching from the Agamas, which is like, you know, some, sometimes now you find that the Theravada teachers they don't teach from the commentaries, they now teach from the Nikayas, from the original teachings. So Yinshan was doing the same, but in the, uh, but in the Agamas. Okay, so just like Yinshan went back to the original teachings that were found in the scriptures, so in late 20th century, you got a similar phenomena in the Theravada. Basically, the Theravada teachings just like the Mahayana teachings developed into a whole philosophical system based on the commentaries, so the Theravada teachings developed into a whole philosophical system based on the Theravada commentaries, and they were not teaching from the original scriptures. So the same development that happened in the Mahayana also happened in the Theravada. And then later in the 20th century, when people started 
looking back and reflecting on uh, what, you know, the situation, how far those philosophical uh, systems had departed from the original teachings, then a number of teachers, both in China and in, for instance, Sri Lanka, they started going back to the original teachings and teaching from the scriptures. Now, how did they get through the desert? Along the way, there are various oases, like around this area is Tashkent, still exists today, it's the capital of one, one of the republics that broke away from the Soviet Union when the Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, you've got Khotan, it was also established in, those, in those, that period, and other oases along the way. And all those o o oases were like city-states. It's because in, the, in that particular area, there's some water, basically, you know. So what you would do is go from oasis to oasis. But sometimes those oases were quite a long way away. So then what do you do? That's when the monastics came to, to their aid, if you like. Because the monastics like to live in caves, in remote places, that's kind of good for them. So between those oases, what they did was dig their way into cliffs. And how they would get supported was that the merchants who were going through would make donations to the monasteries. It's what we would call a symbiotic relationship. The monastics are providing shelter and the merchants are supporting the monasteries. So all along this route, these silk routes, you find these fantastic, unbelievable monasteries that have been carved into the cliff faces and into the caves and so on. So for instance, there's one around this area called uh, Dunhuan. Okay, so Dunhuan is an oasis around this area. It's in the Gobi Desert. Dunhuan is sometimes called the longest art gallery in the world because for about two or three kilometers along a cliff wall with a, you know, uh, there's a river which has created a gorge yeah, and they've built the caves into the cliff face and they run for about two or three kilometers so there are something like a thousand caves or something and inside, they put up, you know, they're full of statues. They painted the walls. So there's thousands and thousands of murals. It's one of the greatest art treasures in the world is in Dun Juan. And what is more, Dun Juan is in the Gobi Desert. So the Gobi Desert is extremely dry. So a lot of that material has been preserved, you see. Through, through the centuries, because eventually that uh, settlement was abandoned. And when it was abandoned, it was left to its own devices. So some of it has, um, has decayed, of course, over, over the centuries, but st a lot of it is still there. So you can actually visit uh, Dun Juan, but at the moment you can only go into about six of those caves because the um, archaeological department won't open up the others because even those six cage, caves are getting damaged. But it's not the only one. Dun Juan is, you know, perhaps the, uh, you know, the, 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 the most famous and the most uh, wonderful example of cave temples. But also when you go back over here, there's a, there's a number of these temples. They're called Thousand Buddha Temples you know, for obvious reasons. It's a descriptive title, you know. They had so many of these caves, they were able to put a thousand Buddha statues in them. And then, then so, so many of these different cave temples along this silk route were known as thousand Buddha temples. They're still there, but they're very much in a state of decay now. And uh, some, sometimes they've been very heavily vandalized as well. Uh, because eventually, you see, along these silk routes, the, the Muslims who were, arose in this area, the Muslims also came across Iran, 
they went into Central Asia and over to China. So that's how far across the Islamic religion got. And those, you see, were all originally, all these areas were Buddhist. If you go to this area, the Buddhist remains are absolutely enormous. But they're, they're you know, because the Muslims, you know, have their own teachings and things like this, like the Bamiyan statues, you know, ev eventually, it took them a month. Many people don't know this. They didn't just blow it up just like that. It took them a month to blow up those statues. But still, if you go to this area of Gandhara, you see, you will find that th 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 there are so many ancient Buddhist temples. There are still so many remains are there. So at that time, you see, if you think about it, we'll start from Pataliputta. That was the, that's where Buddhism arose. It had come down into Sri Lanka. It went down into Southeast Asia. It went out through Gandhara, that means Afghanistan if you like, up through these Central Asian states, down into China. By the second century, it's gone down into Vietnam. So it's reaching in two different ways now. It's joined up. So by the second century, Vietnam had uh, Buddhism. It's very early, if you think about it. It's quite remote. It had gone into Qian, or what was Chang'an at those days, and then down into Vietnam. And then by the fourth century, over into Korea, you know, more or less by this route, and then into Japan, via, probably via Korea is how it's got there. You think about it, this whole area in those days is Buddhist. An enormous area, it was one of the biggest religious empires in the world in those days. It covers the whole of China, all of Southeast Asia, the whole of India, all of Central Asia. And, and what is more, uh, the, the other thing that I was talking about ever, uh, earlier is wherever Buddhism went, also the civilizing effect that it had, you know, the, the invention of paper, and you know the writing down of scriptures and all these sort of things you know these are all uh, b because of buddhism the artworks that exist even up until these days it's it's through buddhism the sculptures the temples so many of the, all the cultural artifacts that you find throughout asia it's actually come through buddhism originally so it's an enormous contribution that has been made to uh, civilization, if you like, but civilization in the good sense, because civilization has also got a dark side, you know? Like the dark side is things like, the, the Chinese, for instance, invented paper. They also invented gunpowder. But the Buddhists didn't invent gunpowder. You know, the Buddhists have invented things that are really useful for people, like paper, you know, and like artworks and things like this. But the civil authorities, you know, what they're interested in is, you know, force and conquest, and, and they invent things like gunpowder to blow people apart, you know, and, and better weapons and so on. Even till this day, you know, they still invented better weapons, more effective weapons, kill more people at one go. But the, the effect of the religion throughout Asia, wherever it went, was always a civilizing effect. For one thing, it's taken an extremely refined and uh, well-taught ethical system. So people are learning how to behave properly and not in brutal ways with each other. So it's having a civilizing effect in that way. But also, all the cultural artifacts that you find originate through, through Buddhism. You know, whether you're looking at the, you know, the cave temples in Ajanta, and Elora, Betsa, Kale, those paintings go back to two centuries before Christ. Very old. The oldest book in the world is a Buddhist book. The invention of uh, printing is a Buddhist invention. All the way through, what you, what you have is 
what I'm trying to impress on you, you see, is, is just what the Buddhist heritage actually involves. If you look at the contribution of Buddhism uh, to world civilization, it's the greatest contribution of any organized anything that you've ever had, you know. The Buddhists have given more value to the world than any other group that you can think of, whether you're thinking of a religious group or a civil society group. They also have a law system as well. The, when you look at the um, Sangha, the Sangha is still uh, run by the Vinaya rules. That's the oldest enforced law code in the world. It's still enforced today. The way that we run the Sangha, the way that we do ordinations, when we get together on the oppositor, all the uh, things that we do in the Sangha comes from Lord Buddha's time. There's no law code that lasted that long, but it still lasted, you see. Perhaps on the, on the basis that it was just such a good code. Many other codes that were invented along the way, after that time, they're abandoned after a while. You look how quickly the laws change in Malaysia. But still we run the Sangha by a code that was written 2,500 years ago. It's an incredible thing, you see. It's an incredible achievement. This is what I wanted to impress on you, to show you how the cultures moved out from the, from the earliest times, so you get an idea of the spread, till you've covered a whole continent. You've covered this whole area. It's had an enormously civilizing effect. And, you know, there are all these uh, wonderful remains. Um, but what is happening is, I think, because people don't understand the, this background, people don't understand their heritage and things like this, a lot, a lot of this stuff is just being destroyed. It's being neglected either by ourselves as Buddhists or by, you know, other groups who have taken over during that time, like the Muslims, because they don't care for it. And all our heritage, which is the greatest contribution to world civilization, is being lost. So really, you see, one of the things I want to give these talks for is to try to raise people's consciousness about our heritage, how wonderful it is, and what is happening to it. If we understand you know, what our background is, and you know what contribution has been made uh, throughout the ages you know then it gives us also a sense of place a sense of belonging uh, and, and a sense of connection with our whole background and you know we can carry it forward with some strength into the future okay so everybody say sadhu